please share with the people out there. We're dealing with being gifted, maximizing your God-given potential. Um, one of the things that we want to talk about is understanding that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. When God calls you to do something, he has equipped you and God does not change his mind about you. In the book of Romans 11 and 29, it states that for these gifts and callings are without repentance. That means once he gives it, he's not taking it back. So God's mind is not changing about you. Your mind may change about you, but God's mind is not changed about you. And so even for those it may have been as though that time has passed and you didn't obey what you believe God originally told you to do, but God has given you an opportunity for a second chance that this will be your pivot month. And this will be your year of, of a divine shift and transfer and change that God is calling you. He's calling you to come on and to do this thing. And one of the things that we got to understand is God has equipped all of us. God has gifted and graced all of us to do something. And we have to understand that. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 8, it says, For by grace are we saved through faith. Then it says, Not of works, least any man should boast. And so we understand that God saves us um, for a purpose. But then when he saves us and he delivers us and sets us free, there's a purpose and a plan that he has for us. And now we understand that these gifts and callings have been given by God. But now in the book of Ephesians chapter 10, it says this, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, walk in them. What good works, the things that he created us for God has created you with purpose in mind. So you have a purpose now here. Now I feel like I need to say this. You matter. You matter. Listen, Satan can try to make you feel as though that you're insignificant, that what you do doesn't matter. I mean, from the person who's the CEO to the mother who stays at home to raise her children. God has a purpose and a plan for everything. And just as much as that person who's preaching to nations and that person who stayed at home to raise those children so that they can go out to fulfill their God given purpose. Listen, God has a plan. And God wants you to flourish in whatever it is he has created and called for you to do. But God wants you to be fulfilled. And there's some things I want to bring across and I want to talk about, even as we're um, discussing this today, that God, number one, you've been created with something in mind. So when God created you, that means he equips you for whatever he has called you to do. So that means right now that we are saved by grace. We talked about that in Ephesians 2 and 9. We are saved by grace. Now, that means we are saved to be someone. We are saved to be someone. We are saved to become the righteousness of God. We are saved to become kings and priests. We are saved to become the righteousness of ambassadors for Christ, rulers and reigners in his earth. But now this is also something interesting. So also as a child of God, we're equally empowered by that same grace to do something. So not only are we um, saved to be something, we are saved to do something. So now one of the first things I've been big on is understanding your identity, understanding who you are in Christ, first and foremost. If you understand who you are in Christ, then you can begin to flow and to function in that grace that you have. And so one of the things we got to understand that God has given us all an assignment and he has equipped us with the tools to get that assignment done. So now this is very important. This is very important to understand. We all have an assignment. We all have an assignment. So now my challenge to you is to discover that assignment. And we want to help you to discover that those assignments for your life, for you to begin to walk in those good works that you were created. Now, I believe in the book of Ephesians 2:10. I used to preach on this all the time, dealing with the good life. He says, um, he said, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained. He says, yeah, that we should walk in them, living the good life, living the good life that he prearranged, living this life. So your good life is attached to your assignment. Your good life is attached to the thing that you were graced by God to do. And so sometimes we look at what other people are doing and seeing them running their race and running it in their grace. And we want to do the same thing, but we are not graced to do what they do. You are supposed to be graced to do 
your grace to only do what God has called you to do. And so with that, you got to understand that what your grace for God is going to prosper you in. That's where you're going to prosper. That's where you're going to flourish. Listen, not the get rich quick schemes and all of those things, businesses and all that stuff is good. It has its place, but you got to be mindful. The thing that you're really going to flourish at is the thing that you've been graced and created by God to do. And then sometimes you got to learn how to, in some cases, monetize in those, in those particular areas, but God will show you, he will bless you. You don't have to chase the paper. You chase God's purpose and the paper will show up. And so you got to understand God wants to bless you extravagantly. He wants to increase you greatly, but it's going to be in that thing that he created for you to do. So now we can go ahead and turn it to sound down. Uh, because I want to, I want to get in this flow. I want to get in this flow because now, um, I had them had some, some, some music flowing in the background. One of the things I realized when you call, understand what you're called and gifted by God to do, you know, certain things, how to activate your gifts. And for me, even from a prophetic vo- being a prophetic voice, there's certain music, there's certain chords that get me in the flow. And then I know too, if I want to stay in a certain vein, there's certain sounds that I want to hear. That, that activates that anointing on my life. But God wants me to really hone in on this today and really get you to see that number one, you've been saved by grace. Number two, you've been empowered by that same grace to do something. So that grace that caused you to be something is the same grace that's called you to do something. That's very important. And so now with God equipping us with the tools to get the assignment done, we have to now learn how to develop those tools. Now, the book of 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says it like this, who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time even began. So God already set this thing up. He already had purpose with you in mind. So God created you. He knew before you even showed up the thing you were coming to this planet to do. And you were plugged in to this earth to now be plugged into your purpose and the vein through which in the grand scheme of things with the billions and billions of people all around this planet, there is a divine assignment that God created for you to do. Yes, you man. Yes, you woman. Yes, you child. Everybody under the sound of my voice, everyone was created with purpose in mind. And so when you flourish in that purpose, some of you are great encouragers. Some of you are people who were created by God to now do business, to create wealth so that now you can funnel it into the kingdom of God to advance. Um, I I heard this, this, uh, this encounter with this preacher and he went to go preach at a, at at a conference somewhere. And so the the gentleman that invited him picked him up and they went golfing and things of that nature. And so on the way back, he was dropping the preacher off after his assignment was done. He preached and did what he was supposed to do. And so when they were on their way back, I believe from the golf course, the, 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 the guy, he was a businessman. He asked the preacher, he said, man, I want to ask you something. He said that I, you know, um, just, just really been bugging at me. Um, and he had been talking about just working and, and taking all this time to build his business. And I think at that time, the business would, um, was maybe bringing in about $9 million or whatever. And he had been working hard for years, just building the business and doing those things. And so he was like, okay, I'm ready to kind of just call it quits. I'm ready to just put it aside because, um, it was just, he felt like, okay, it was just time to do it. He was tired of doing all the hustle and bustle and all those things. And then all of a sudden, and then he was just sharing some other things, complaining about some things. And then as he was talking to the preacher, he asked the preacher his opinion on him, like shutting down his business and, and doing something different. And then all of a sudden, the preacher, as he was listening, he was like, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm depending on you to share with me and to get me to share whatever it is I need to share with this guy. And so he opened up his mouth and he began to tell him, he says, now, he says, as me as a preacher, I've been going all around this planet, been preaching the gospel, been writing books, been doing all these things. You know what? I'm just ready to go ahead and shut down. I'm going to stop preaching. I'm going to stop sharing the love of Christ with people. I'm going to stop doing these things. He said, what you think about that? The guy said this. He said, he told the preacher, he says, you know what? I don't want to be you when I see Jesus then, because he knew that, wait a minute, you've been called by God to do this. 
He said this, the preacher said this to that businessman. He said, you just said the same thing to me. In other words, the preacher saw, the, the businessman saw what the preacher was doing as being called by God and building kingdom, but he wasn't looking at what he was doing as being kingdom work. So the guy dropped, dropped the preacher off, and then about six months or so later, um, the preacher just had this in his heart to call the guy. He says, man, how you been doing? Just wanted to check on you. He says, man, I, I want to tell you something. He says, I have not been able to rest. He said, it's a good thing. He says, I've been troubled, right? He said, it's a good thing or burden. He says, since I had that conversation with you, he says, I readjusted my focus. I began to take on what I was doing as an assignment from God, as my part in the kingdom. He says, now I'm in the process now of turning the $9 million business into a $35 million business to funnel money into the kingdom of God to support the work of God. What happened to that businessman? He adjusted his mind. He didn't see at first what he was doing. He was just seeing it as work. And this is what a lot of people do. They try to divide what they say called the secular and the sacred. That a lot of times people think they're only doing kingdom work when they serve in that church. And they don't see them being a coach, them being an entrepreneur, them being a teacher, that that's advancing the kingdom of God. Just as much as a pastor in a pulpit, a preacher in a pulpit, the usher at church, the singers on stage, that the person who is in an environment that's advancing humanity and getting God's agenda done, even in a quote unquote secular environment, that God is saying this, you have to shift your mindset where kingdom is concerned. We're not talking about church. In other words, the organized state of religion where we come into this one place that we call the house of God, that we understand that our bodies are the temple of the living God. I'm a preacher. I've been in ministry for years, but it's one of those things that God is saying it's time for people to expand their, their thought process where ministry and kingdom advancement is concerned. The person who's a businessman, we call it marketplace ministry. And that's been a real quote unquote chic term lately. People have been picking up on it for the past few years. And we've been seeing a greater understanding that you know what? Our thought processes are changing. This generation, you know, generations, and I didn't even begin to intend on going this route, but more is coming out of me as I'm talking. When we think generations, even biblically, generations are really considered like 40 years. Every 40 years is considered, quote unquote, a new generation. But in this day and time, we really, and how quick our culture changes, really we consider now a generation about every 10 years, that 10 year gap between ages and generations. So sometimes it could be 10 to 20, 10 to 15, but you get the point what I'm saying. Sometimes things change so rapidly we have to be on our toes and we have to be flexible to serve this generation. That's good, God. If you learn how to serve your generation, you'll always be flexible and you'll always look for opportunities to serve people in any capacity of life, whether it's in the church, whether it's on the PTA, the school board, whether it's on the city council, wherever it is, you've been created by God to serve. And you need to take on the kingdom mandate that I have a part to play, no matter how small I think it is, no matter how big I think it is. Everything that I do, I do it as unto the Lord. That means you are a kingdom representative everywhere you go. So that's the mindset that you need to have. So that means from how you dress to how you carry yourself, you are a kingdom representative. You never know who you're going to come across. You never know who God is going to lead you to speak to. You know, that's why sometimes it, it can be something as simple as, man, um, I remember there are times I would go out and the spirit of God would say, I want you to wear this. Now, I'm not trying to be deep, not trying to be all super spiritual and spooky, none of that, but I'm sensitive to the spirit of God. And sometimes it's like, because you don't know who you're getting ready to come across. And sometimes they'll judge based off of my apparel at that time, whether it's casual or whether it's dressy, whatever the case is. Sometimes you don't know what God is trying to do in somebody else's life. And based off your presentation may determine how they receive from you. And so like Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. 
Some people love the fact that I can rock my hat, my fitted hat cock to the side, and I throw on my chain and my jewelry here and there and go out. And my wife, she always people me, call me the hip hop preacher. And it's like, okay, I'm out there, but I'm being me. There are times I love to put on the suit and tie. There are times I love to throw on the jeans and the Tims. No matter what, no matter where I am, there's an anointing and a grace upon my life to teach God's people who they are. And I want to be flexible to be able to minister in any environment that I go into. So you have to be ready. You have to be equipped. There's somebody that needs you. You, I don't care if you're in your eighties, your nineties, going on a hundred, there's still something you can do that God wants you, whether it's to mother, whether it's to father this next generation, there could be something where you just love on the children from the community as they come into the building. You can establish your own community centers and be there to love on them because you don't know the, the housing and the, and just the things that they're going through. I'm not just talking about in the projects, I'm talking about in the suburbs as well, because there's just as much stuff going on in the million dollar homes as it is in the, in, the, in the hood. No matter where you are, people are dealing with issues and you can do something to minister to their lives. So you need to be ready, you need to be open, you need to be willing and able to do what it is God has called for you to do. Now the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 says it like this. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, that, um, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He says this, the point I want to reference is in 1 Corinthians 1 and 26, this is out of the New King James Version. It says, for you see your calling. God wants you to see your calling. He wants you to understand what you've been called by him to do so that you can lock in and focus in what it is he's called you to do. Now, in, uh, Ephes in uh, Ephesians chapter four, verse one, Ephesians chapter four, verse one, out of the New Living Translation, it reads like this. It says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. So he says, I want you to live a life worthy of your calling because you have been called. You have been called. Yes, you that's watching this right now. You were called by God, whether it was to raise up some kings in this earth, to go forth and to do a mighty work, to, to, to raise up some queens, whether it's to, to, to train, to develop, whether it's to motivate, whether it's to, I don't care, from cooking to cleaning, I don't care from, from motivation to training, whatever it is, from flying airplanes to putting out fires, you are called by God. And so if you take on what you are doing as a calling, you will begin to function in it different. And as you function in it different, there's a grace, there's an ability by God that will begin to heighten upon you to cause your gifts, talents, and abilities to come forth in a greater way. So whatever it is, whatever it is, that's right, from policemen, the, from the chief of police to the uh, foot patrolman on the street, Listen, you are called by God. Some of you right now, especially what's going on in the earth and the uprising and the great tension between people in society and law enforcement, God may call you, calls you and call you to change the narrative, to be that person that goes into communities and begins to change the view of how people see the law, how people see and understand authority and receive authority. That will begin, I'm telling you, that is huge. That is huge. You can be the person who diffuses something before it gets started. You can be the person who stops the person that's getting ready to turn into a mass shooter because now you caught them in the early stages and just begin to pour life into them. All you saw was that little kid that nobody was paying attention to. All you see is that person who seems like they're just happy go lucky, but God is leading you to say, you know what? I need for you to speak to them because in you speaking to them, you're going to deposit a seed that's going to stop the plan of the enemy from coming to pass in their life. There are people that are out there that are hungry to receive what you have. 
Some of you have raised up great individuals. And so just you even beginning to teach this new generation of parents how to raise kings and queens in this earth to rule and reign. See, you, God graced you to do it. God has given you wisdom to do it. God, is, listen, you've been through a lot. And listen, everything you've been through has not just been for you, but God wants to use it to help somebody else. What is it that God is calling you to do? I want you to begin. God is calling this thing, man, I'm telling you. It's like this great call. People, we call it the clarion call of God, where it's like God is just, it's a mass calling going out to the world and everybody's called. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. The chosen ones are the ones that show up. And so we got to understand that there is a calling and we're supposed to abide in that calling where we're in, we were called. That's out of the book of first Corinthians seven and 20. We're supposed to says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. There's something about consistency in what you're doing. You know, I've seen some generals go um, um, before us to go to be with the Lord. And one of the biggest attributes is consistency. It's like they didn't go with the trends. They didn't follow. They did what they were supposed to do. And see, understanding your calling and your assignment, you know, sometimes those things can be entertain interchangeable, but sometimes they can be a separate. Because I'm say like me, I'm called to preach, but my assignment is to teach God's people who they are. That's the message God has given me. So I know I'm going to talk about your authority, rights, and privileges. I'm going to talk about who you are in Christ, the authority he's given you and how to exercise that authority. That's my main message to the body of Christ. I know that. So I'm cool with that. Now I can teach on other things. I can teach on healing. I can teach on relationships. I can teach on all these other things. But when it comes to just talking about who you are, that you the righteousness of God and that Jesus died for your sins, past, present and future. And he already made you in his sight. There's something that awakens in me because that's what God called me to do. Because what he called you to do will awaken a passion in you. It'll give you strength. It'll give you life. Energy comes when you begin to walk in what you're called by God to do. So God's saying, I want to awake the sleeping giant that's in you. Some of you have been worn out because you've been in the wrong place and in, and in, in the wrong, see, you've been in the wrong place for so many years that it's worn you out because you were not graced to do the thing that you've been doing for 20 years. And now you've worn yourself out, but God wants to replenish you. He wants to restore you. He wants to bring life back to you. And some of you now you're going to find things that you're going to start doing that you're going to enjoy these next 10, 20 years more than you enjoyed the first 40 or 50 years. God wants you to be blessed and to be happy. He wants you to now receive everything you've been believing for, everything you've been praying for, everything you have been fasting for, everything you've been sowing for, everything God wants to bring it to pass in your life. Okay, let me settle down. I'm just here preaching. Hey, man, this is good. Glory to God. <laughs> now, number two, this goes back to something I just said. I want to give you scriptural reference for it. When you do the will of God, it will energize you. It will energize you. Listen, I'm a witness to this. I know what that feels like when, when, when certain things don't work out or something is, is messed up. But then all of a sudden, when you connect into that thing that you know God has called you to do, there's nothing, it's nothing like being in a sweet spot with God. It's nothing like doing that thing. Man, I remember um, coming up in ministry and uh, I was a single guy in ministry. I go to work, work full time. I would do prayer in the morning, go to work, come back to the church you know, go to classes, serve in youth ministry, serve on college ministry and do all these things. And man, listen, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I mean, I could be the first one there and the last one to leave. There were times we'd be there in rehearsals and things and the presence of God would hit. Sometimes I'd be there in early in the morning hours and then still have to get up to go to work the next day. But it, it was just something that I just loved to do because I knew this was the place I was called to be. This is who I was called to be. And so when you're in that lane, there's going to be progression. When you're in that lane, God wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to multiply. So it'll energize you. Now, the book of John chapter four, verse 34 says like this. This is out of the new King James, John four thirty-four. It says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That, what does food um, provide? Food gives us strength. Food gives us nourishment. See, to do the will of God in our lives energizes us. It feeds us. It strengthens us. And so when you get into it, you come alive. You come alive. You come alive. I always uh, would tell my wife this. because she, She's a giver. She loves outreach. And sometimes I've never, I never, I, when I see her at her happiest when, is when she's giving to somebody else. When she's able to organize stuff, food drives, all this stuff, that is just in her heart. That's in her. She was raised like that. It's just in her. When she does it, she comes alive. She'll be out there working for hours on her feet. Now, she might be tired when she finished, but she loved doing it, boy. She, she'll get that thing. And it, but it's just one of those things. I love preaching. It's like what Paul says, woe unto me unless I preach the gospel. I love encouraging people. I love pouring life into people. I love speaking life into people. I love getting into that word. I love worship and praise. All of these things, these things that are, are, are just ingrained in me. I love it. I love it. I love God being able to use me to speak into people's lives and to see the things that are binding them up for the purpose of delivering them and setting them free. When I position myself, I, I tell people all the time, man, I've been in this thing for over 20 some years, 23, 24 years. And every time God uses me to speak into somebody's life supernaturally, it's still, I'm still like a kid. It's like, man, God, no matter how many times I've done it, it's still amazing to me for him to show me things that there's no way I could know about it except the spirit of God reveals it to me and to see that person delivered, to see that person set free. And when you see that tear break boy, and all of a sudden God has pierced somebody's heart and you see them delivered and set free because you were obedient to do what you were graced by God to do. There's nothing like it. It's the stuff you'll do if you didn't get paid for it. And the blessing is God will put the money in there for you to get paid to do it. God will bless you. God will, that's something he want to get across to you. Yep. You're not doing it for the money, but he will bring it along with the package. That's part of your benefits package. And he says, I want you to expect that because that goes into also now where you discover, see you discovering your gifts, but also learning how to fine tune your gifts. Because now there's a thing too, though, when, you know, here's why it's important for you to, to discover your gifts. Um, now, now I'm going to use this scripture that I'm getting ready to bring up. Yes, it's a little out of context, but when I read it, you're going to see what I, what I mean, but it still can be a principle that you pull out to use in the book of Proverbs 18, 16. Okay. In the, um, this is the English standard version. I believe it is English standard version, Proverbs 18, 16. It says a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. And a lot of times we always hear that a man's gift will make room for him and bring before great men, a man's gift. Now, actually in the Hebrew, that word gift really is gratuity. It's a present. It's something that you're giving. It's an offering. So it's just like if you give something to someone, it'll open the door for you to get access to them and into their lives. Just like if somebody sows into your life, it's like, man, come on, man. Oh, praise God. Love you, man. Thank you so much. Come on, sit down talk with me. How you doing? You know, because what it does is it opens the gateway for you to come in. But now most people use it as the gift that you have, the ability or the talent will make room. Yes, that is true. That, that is true. People need to see what you're good at. And once they see what you're good at, it will open up doors for opportunities for you. So at the same time, your gift, as you begin to function in it, people will begin to see it and people will be drawn and gravitated to assist you in what you are wired by God, uh, clothed by God, graced by God to do. You need to understand that. There are some people that's trying to motivate you to write books, but you ain't as motivated to do it. And people say, listen, people need to hear what you have to say. They need to hear you need to be, you need to do a YouTube channel. You need to do something, sit down and just talk, share your wisdom with people. And that's how God might start with some of you just doing the simplest thing. Okay. Now that, that word, and now this terminology, I want to give you a definition of something in this scripture, this terminology makes room. It's a verb that indicates to enlarge, to extend, to open wide. 
It means to gain living space. It means to gain territory. Who is it? Um, uh, Jabez, the prayer of Jabez, Lord, enlarge my territory. Sometimes you don't have more because you're not asking for more. You're not allowing your gift to shine through you, especially when you're doing the work of the Lord. God wants you to accelerate in what you're called to do. He wants you to grow in what you're called to do. And sometimes you've been stagnant in your gift. And so now I want, I want you to hear this statement. Now I got this quote um, from John Bevere and I wanted to recite this quote. I'm giving him credit for it. Um, and he got it from somebody else. That's the interesting thing that when you discover your gifts, you will move in the right direction. When you discover your gifts, you will move in the right direction. But when you develop your gifts, you will rise in the right direction. Let me say that again. When you discover your gifts, you move in the right direction. So you're going towards that thing. But when you develop it, you begin to rise in it. You begin to become an expert in the area that you've been graced and called by God to do. See, gifts are given, but skills are developed. So it's your job to develop the skill set in the thing that you're gifted to do. The more you do it or the better you do it, the sharper when you hone in your craft, hone in your skills. When you become, yeah, I knew I was graced by God to preach, but I ended up going to school. I ended up learning how to put messages together. I ended up learning how to talk to crowds. I had to learn how to counsel people. I had to hone in the things that I began to become better at. And even by reason of use, I became better at it. Even as I train other teachers, other people, listen, you're going to become better the more you do it through repetition. But now, just like the old adage, it's not practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice that makes perfect. So you want to learn how to begin to do the right way what it is you're called by God to do. You're supposed to be the best at what you do. That's part of what a king is. A king is a chief amongst their competitors. In other words, you're the best at it. You're supposed to have the spirit of excellence, which is motivated by the love of God. Because if you have a servant's heart to now serve your generation, how can you serve your generation with the gifts, talents, and abilities that you have? How can you make life better for somebody else? And then how can you present in the best way possible the thing that it is you're called and created by God to do? So whatever it is, now you release your faith and God will, watch this, he'll bring the resources to assist you in now presenting what it is you've been created and called by God to do at the highest level. Go ahead and exercise your faith for high level execution and servanthood. Do it to the best of your ability. Yeah, I know you might make plates for people. You might cook food for everybody, you know, for people. You know, you got tons of people who cook food, but everybody doesn't present it the right way. Everybody doesn't have the right marketing strategy. Everybody doesn't have the right presentation. You know what? You might need to find a graphic designer to now give you a better presentation versus what you're doing. You're doing the best you can with what you got, but sometimes you got to learn how to invest in yourself to begin to increase. Listen, this is increasing your brand. You got to think about it like this. What is your life brand? When people get you, what do they get? What do they get when they get you? Do they get somebody that's lazy? Do they get somebody that's late all the time? Do they get somebody that's not focused? Do they get somebody that doesn't know what they're doing? And so nobody wants to really have people on their team that are incompetent. So you want to be very competent at what it is you're called by God to do. You want to be learned in that thing. Study your craft. Begin to grow yourself. Yep, that means you got to stretch. That means you got to read. That means you have to study to show yourself approved. That means you have to be exposed to more, exposed to greater. Get around people that challenge you to step out of your comfort zone. See, okay. All right, I'll leave it there. You get the point. You get the point. Amen. So now in the book of Proverbs, how much time I got? Oh, I'm, getting, I'm just about finished here. Now I like this. Now don't forget that last statement. Don't for, please don't forget that last statement. That was so important. When you discover your gifts, you will move in the right direction. But when you develop your gifts, you arise in the right one. Some of you know what you're supposed to do. You're just not doing it the right way. God wants you to do it the right way so you can be discovered. Man, that's that that. That's a powerful statement, but I say the real nonchalant. Focus on you. Man, that's good. Come on, man. Come on, man. 
You've been focusing on everybody else. Focus on you. Focus on being the best version of you. Come on, focus on developing yourself. Now listen, when I say the best version of you, listen, we're supposed to be in the image of Christ. We understand that, but God created you with purpose. There's something with your creative ability, with your personality. Man, listen, some of you, you're not maximizing what you're good at. Some of you have great voices and you can do voiceover work for people. You can do voiceover work for ministry. You can create stuff. You can do snippets, sound bites. You can do stuff like that. Something that's simple. You can answer phones and say, you know what? Welcome to so-and-so. Welcome to Spirit of Fire Fellowship. How can we serve you today? We're here to minister the word of God. Some of you are prayer warriors, man. And listen, you can be there to minister to the needs of people. You ain't called to preach, boy, but you can pray heaven down. And so sometimes you might need to be that person that's leading that thing and picking up the phone and calling, praying for people or setting up something to say, hey, if you need prayer, we're here to help. Even in this time, whatever it is, you can be creative. Listen, listen, listen. Sometimes we have to know how to present our gifts, how to present our gifts to the masses. If we present a little better, it'll be received a little better. Sometimes what happens is when we get people who have been conditioned in a church environment and they're trying to present their gift to a secular world, secular world don't always understand church uh, Christianese don't understand the lingo, the language. Listen, I've worked in corporate America for years and it's something when you go into a, a, a setting and people start saying all these acronyms, like, you know what it is. And you go in there and they talking all this stuff and you looking like a cow at a new gate. And it's like, man, what are you talking about? Now sometimes you have to stop and ask people, what do you mean when you say that? And so sometimes the thing is, if you present things in a different way, it can be received in a different way. And then all of a sudden now your gift begins to multiply and increase. What is it? Begin to pray, go beyond the normal parameters of thought. Ask God, how can I do this thing? How can I serve this generation? How can I take my skill, talent and ability and maximize your kingdom, God, because you want to expand your kingdom. You want people to come to the know the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this in the book of Proverbs 22, 29. This is the last scripture. Now this is out of the passion translation. Um, Proverbs 22, 29, it says, if you are uniquely gifted or excel in your work, you will rise and be promoted. You won't be held back. You will stand before Kings. Let me say that again. If you are uniquely gifted or if you excel in your work, you will rise and be promoted. You won't be held back. You will stand before Kings. There are some people not as gifted as you. They just work harder. They work harder at what they do. That's why they've advanced past you. It's not that they're better than you. Their work ethic is better. They've structured themselves better. And God is saying, if you begin to hone in, even though you might be gifted at something, you must develop that thing. You must develop it. And so now God is saying, I need for you to begin to develop because What's making some of your hope deferred is your lack of development and implementation. That God has given you a vision, but you have no structure to implement it. You haven't structured yourself. You haven't positioned yourself to now go out. God wants your, God wants your gifts to come out of hiding. And he needs people to see what you're good at. And there is nothing wrong. You got to understand the difference between ambition and drive. There's a level of ambition that's good to want to be the best at what you do. There's nothing wrong with that. Because sometimes what we call humility is really false humility. When you are humble before God, you agree with what he says about you. If he called you peculiar, if he called you righteous, if he called you a king and a priest, if he called you an ambassador, that means with that declaration of that title of that thing comes the attributes that go along with it. You're supposed to carry yourself regal, not now belittling people, but now when you're, when you walk into a room, your presence demands should demand an explanation. Who is that person? Look at them. Man, they are diligent, man. I, they, listen, they serve me beyond their, the expectation. This is one, this is one thing you got to understand in business under promise over deliver. Some people over promise and under deliver, but if you under promise and over deliver, you know that you can provide five star service, 
But if it's a thing where you said, hey, we'll, we'll provide this, this, and this, and then add the extra onto it because they come in with the expectation and then you blow them away with the extra, it's like, man, be the best of what you can where you currently are. How can you serve with excellence? How can you love on God's people the best? How can you fulfill it? it, it it's the little things, y'all. Sometimes it's the little foxes that spoil the vine in any area of life. How can you now craft who you are, develop who you are, to grow into who you are? You are answer to somebody, and it's time for you to show up. Will the real you please come forward tonight? In Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. We give you glory, and we give you honor for this time. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that it is ministering to the hearts of your people, and we thank you for a divine instruction, divine revelation, and we thank you that your people for, will fulfill the assignment and the calling upon their lives. We give you praise, glory, and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're here tonight, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you want to today. I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me. Listen, just a real simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you were raised from the dead for me. Come inside my heart now, Lord Jesus. I receive you as my Lord. I make you the Lord of my life. Say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me your son. I'm saved now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Friends, if that's you and you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, we want you to contact us. Let us know. You can message us. Tell us, hey, I've just gotten born again, and we will have somebody to reach out to you to let you know how to now grow and increase in the things of God. We are here for you. We want you. If that's you, and you, listen, you don't have a church home, we recommend Spirit of Fire Fellowship to you. Let us pastor you and love on you and minister to you and provide a covering and protection for you. Every person needs a pastor in their lives. Every person needs someone to oversee. One of the things I like to call myself is a prophetic pastor in the sense of God has called me in a prophetic ministry at the same time to feed his sheep and to minister to his people the word of God, to challenge, to change, uh, to train in order to transform. See, one thing is information, and that's good, but I believe in impartation that will cause transformation. So we want to go from information to impartation to transformation so that you can be conformed into the image and likeness of Christ. That should be every believer's goal, to be like Jesus and to follow his plan for our lives. And so, y'all, listen, he's graced us to do it. So if that's you, you want to connect with us, listen, we want you to send us your information. Uh, I believe um, you can just send us a message uh, directly to us uh, via one of our social media platforms, and someone will be more than happy to get in touch with you to love on you. Well, y'all, at this time, we're going to honor God in our giving. There are some uh, uh, forms that in which you can sow into the ministry. We believe, too, that your worship isn't complete unless, until a seed is sown. There's something about it. Listen, Paul said it, the Apostle Paul said it like this. If I give unto you carnal, I mean spiritual things, it's nothing for me to receive carnal things. Even throughout the Old Testament, even going into the New, as they come into the house of God to minister to the Lord and to receive ministry, they would, the people would always bring an offering to now meet the needs of the house of God. And so even in this time, listen, your financial support is important. We believe God off of our giving. We are, listen, as a ministry, we're givers, and we believe too. One thing my pastor we would always teach us is not necessarily depend on the giving of the people, but depend on your own giving. In other words, practice what you preach. And we are givers, we are sowers, and we trust God that he will now begin to bring it back to us again. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. And we've seen God do it. We've seen the hand of God move. We've seen people come out the woodworks and sow. People sometimes you haven't seen in a while, all of a sudden God lays it on their heart and they sow a seed and it helps the ministry, it helps to grow the vision. And this is the thing, whatever you're willing to believe God for, his supply is always there. And God is the God of more than enough. He will always bring more than enough over and above. He is the God of abundance. And so we thank God for him. So even as you're led, whatever God is leading on your heart to do, listen, if you're 
a member of another church, we believe that your tithes should go to your local church to support that work. But if this is your primary place of feeding, the storehouse, the Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. He says, prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pull you out a blessing, you won't have room enough to receive it. He'll rebuke the devourer who is Satan, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I'm coming that you might have life and have it more abundantly. When we honor God with the tithe, listen, I'm telling you that blessing is transferred upon our lives and it activates that blessing and we begin to walk in the fullness. Man, you can expect to receive, I mean, great and mighty things from the Lord. And you can expect things to work better, things to last longer. Thing, I'm telling you, when you honor God, God honors you. When you say here, because you bless me with this already, is nothing of me to bring a tenth, a tithe to you. And then anything over and above is an offering as we offer unto the Lord. Sometimes it could be a sacrificial offering. It might be a sacrifice at that time to sow $20 or to do whatever. I don't put monetary numbers out there usually, but it's one of those things where, hey, if God is telling you to sow this, then, listen, whenever God tells you to sow a seed, he always has a harvest for you in mind. Whenever he tells you to sow a seed, he always has a harvest in mind for you. He knows what's coming ahead. He knows the need that's going to be there in the near future. And so a lot of times your present day obedience will determine your future provision. So when you sow now, listen, it's an investment. It, the greatest investment you can make is in the kingdom of God. So now as God is leading you, we've given you the different platforms in which you can sow. As you do it, do it with joy, expect harvest, and we'll believe in God with you. Praise God. Well, y'all, I'm out of time, certainly not out of message, but we thank God right now that you will walk in your gifts, talents, and abilities, and that you will walk in the fullness of what God has called for you to do. So e even as we're departing now, listen, we speak the blessing of the Lord upon you. We speak the strength of God. We speak his favor upon you right now. Everywhere you go, favor is showing itself strong on your behalf in the name of Jesus. And we declare too that health and healing is your portion, that you walk in divine health, Every disease, germ, virus, bad bacteria, and infirmity that touches your body dies instantly. And you are healthy and you are strong now in the name of Jesus. Your immune system is strong and it wards off sickness and disease. Glory to God. So we just thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Love you guys. We're here at Spirit of Fire Fellowship, a change in the culture, igniting a passion, and living a dream. God bless you all, and I'll see you next time. Peace.